The Battle of the Little Bighorn was a pivotal event in what became known as the Centennial Campaign. The United States was celebrating its 100th birthday. The nation was rapidly becoming an industrial power, and the idea of an Indian War was anachronistic to most. However, two years earlier, bowing to pressure from one of those industrial forces, the Northern Pacific Railroad, Lieutenant General Philip Sheridan, the military commander who had oversight for the Great Plains, had sanctioned a military expedition into the Black Hills under the pretext of finding a suitable location for a fort from which the army could protect the Lakota and the Northern Cheyenne from encroaching prospectors and settlers who were lured to the Black Hills by rumors of gold. Lieutenant Colonel George A. Custer commanded the expedition, which became famous for the discovery of gold in the Black Hills, not for locating a fort site. Horatio Nelson Ross's find hit the headlines and soon individuals seeking their fortunes were stampeding to the Black Hills. The only problem was, when they arrived, they were trespassers. The Black Hills was and remains the holy land of the Lakota and Cheyenne. The Lakota and Cheyenne had fought and won the war that closed the Bozeman Trail and resulted in the government suing for peace. Some representatives from the tribes then agreed to sign what became known as the 1868 Fort Laramie Treaty, under which the Lakota were guaranteed all of present-day western South Dakota, some 26 million acres of land for their undisturbed use and occupancy, a swath of country that included the Black Hills. The 1868 Fort Laramie Treaty created division amongst the Lakota and Northern Cheyenne. Some leaders such as Chief Red Cloud signed it, but others like Sitting Bull and Crazy Horse rejected it as they had no faith in the government's paper or promises. The Northern Cheyenne leaders who signed it were duped, which created discontent among their people and left them disenfranchised in their own homeland. The so-called non-treaty signers of Sitting Bull, Crazy Horse, Ice, and other leaders led their people into what the treaty designated as unceded territory, 34 million acres of land that stretched from the Black Hills to the Bighorn Mountains, the Yellowstone River to the Platte. Even if they had signed the treaty, the treaty provided no warrant for the U.S. government to remove them from this country. But the claimer to annex the Black Hills was such that when negotiations to acquire the Black Hills from the Lakota leaders who had signed the treaty failed, President Ulysses S. Grant authorized the military campaign to settle the matter. Using false intelligence as a pretext, Grant authorized the Secretary of Interior to issue an ultimatum to the non-treaty signers. Report to your agencies by January 31, 1876, or be considered hostile and thus vulnerable to attack. But the Sitting Bull and Crazy Horse people had no agencies to report to, as none had been assigned to them, and they had never signed the treaty. It was this desire to have the Black Hills and the vast mineral wealth to be found there that led Lieutenant Colonel George A. Custer and the 7th U.S. Cavalry to the Little Bighorn on June 25, 1876. Custer had never seen the valley of the Little Bighorn before and was reliant upon his Crow scouts and civilian guides to inform him of what might lie ahead. Custer intended to keep his command concealed near the Wolf Mountains throughout June 25th so his men could rest and he and his officers could prepare the attack he intended to launch the following morning. However, intelligence he received early on June 25th convinced him that he must attack immediately or risk the Indian scattering, which was the military's greatest fear that the Lakota and Cheyenne would melt into the landscape and the campaign would become a costly and lengthy pursuit and possibly humiliation if they failed to cow the Indians. At around noon on June 25, 1876 on the divide near the Wolf Mountains, Custer and his adjutant William W. Cook made the battalion assignments for the 566 men, 31 officers and 50 civilian scouts and guides and the 7th Cavalry's march to battle began. Custer dispatched Captain Frederick W. Benteen with three companies to scout to the left, hoping that Benteen would provide up-to-date intelligence. If Benteen reported no Indians to the south, the likelihood was that the village wasn't yet moving, or at least not that way. Major Marcus Reno was assigned three companies, Custer retained five companies, and the pack train was given one company to aid and protect it as it lumbered behind. At approximately 2.15 p.m. at the location that became known as the Lone Teepee, some six miles from the Little Bighorn, Fred Gerard, one of Custer's guides and interpreters, informed him that the Indians were running like devils, and Custer dully ordered Major Marcus A. Reno to advance. Adjutant Cook imparted Custer's orders to Reno. Reno was to cross the Little Bighorn and then moving south to north, 
was to advance on the fleeing villagers at as rapid a gait as the Major thought prudent, and then he was to charge thereafter in the knowledge that Custer would support him. Reno moved forward and Custer then decided not to cross the river and to move his five companies in a northerly direction to shadow Reno, concealing his men behind the bluffs. The Lakota and Cheyenne encampment was large, but not anything like the exaggerated proportion that has been portrayed since that day. Approximately 650 teepees were arranged along the Little Bighorn River, loosely conforming to traditional tribal designations. The village there was approximately 850 men and boys who might fight. As Reno advanced, most people were going about their everyday business. Some of the men were fishing, some were digging wild turnips. Chief Gull was eating his lunch. But the calm was disrupted when Little Bear came thundering into the village. His son had just been killed by scouts and the soldiers were coming. Immediately, the Hunkpapa Lakota of Sitting Bull, the people camped at the south end of the village in Reno's line of fire, prepared to defend the village. Sitting Bull was a spiritual and civil leader. His days of war had passed, and he did not participate in the fight as a combatant. Instead, he gave the sacred items of war to his nephew, One Bull, and told him to defend the people when it was obvious that the soldiers had not come to talk. <laughs>